What's new from Apple? There's the new iPhone 16 Pro, built for Apple intelligence. And it comes with the all-new camera control, giving you an easier way to quickly access your camera tools. The new Apple Watch Series 10 has our biggest display and our thinnest design ever. And this? It's the sound of active noise cancellation, now available on one of two new AirPods 4 models. So quiet. Check out all of the new products and new features at Apple.com. You can even buy yourself something new. See Apple.com for product availability updates. Apple Intelligence coming this fall. Hear that? Pumpkin. That's fall calling. And the pumpkin spice latte is back at Starbucks. From that first sweater to late autumn weather, it's all of fall in just one sip. Order ahead on the Starbucks app. Hi, I'm Shannon, the podcast producer here at C-SPAN. And this week on the Lectures in History podcast, presidential historian Lindsay Truvinsky discusses how presidential foreign policy and war-making powers evolve from the time of George Washington to the modern era. Hang tight, class starts right after this. Hi, everyone. So we're going to get started um, on uh, our third lecture, Foreign Policy and War Powers. As we discussed this morning, we are going to change up the format a little bit. So I'm going to give the lecture and then I'm going to ask you guys to hold your questions if you can until the end, because there's a microphone in the center and it's really important that we ask the questions into the microphone, not so that I can't hear you, because obviously I can hear you, but so that the camera can pick up on it. So Um, But you were so wonderfully engaged earlier this morning, so I hope that the change in format won't dissuade any questions uh, or dissuade any um, engagement uh, at the end of our chat. So one of the strange things about foreign policy is that it doesn't actually say what it is. We talked this morning about the president's treaty-making powers and how those are clearly defined in the Constitution, but that has come to be one very small part of what it actually means to craft foreign policy. There is, of course, the war part of foreign policy, and then there is the not-war part, but the not-war part has a lot of different pockets. And so we are going to explore what some of those pockets are and how they have evolved over time as presidents have expanded their, their business and their authority and what it means to be president to have this pretty expansive uh, power and authority. So I've kind of broken that down into a couple of buckets here. We have treaties, maintaining alliances that already exist, international representation, trade, borders, and then, of course, if things go badly and you actually have to turn to war. So defining the authority, as we talked about this morning in terms of the Constitution, the Constitution set up a couple of things that the president can do to manage foreign policy. They can appoint councils, they can appoint uh, ministers, they can appoint ambassadors, and that actually involves a fair amount of discretion, because initially there was only a certain budget for those types of ministers, and you had to choose where to send them. And where to send them is actually a pretty important part of maintaining foreign policy, maintaining alliances, partnerships, and having space for those conversations. The Constitution also permitted the president, with the advice and consent of the Senate, to make treaties, which, as we discussed, meant that uh, there was this expectation that the Senate would serve as a council of foreign affairs. And we talked about how Washington was present for every session, had heard these expectations, and fully intended to comply with them once he was actually in office. So accordingly, in the summer of 1789, he was getting ready to send advisors to a peace commission with Native American nations between the Creek and Cherokee nations, as well as North Carolina and South Carolina. There had been a lot of conflict on the western border, and they needed to try and come up with a peaceful solution because the Creek and Cherokee nations were defending their homeland against white incursion, and yet the states also wanted defense measures such that they wouldn't have violence as well. Washington had never done this kind of thing before, and so he wanted to ask the Senate's advice on how he should craft the instructions, what he should tell these representatives, what that should look like, and he wanted the Senate's input. So he first he met with a committee to figure out all of the details that really hadn't been sorted before, like where he would sit when he came in the chamber, where John Adams, who is the president of the Senate, would sit when Washington was present how he would be introduced, when they would talk, what he would bring, 
details that maybe don't seem all that important or seem like they're kind of small and, and silly until you have to make all of those decisions for the first time all at once and they really start to add up to feel quite overwhelming. He also sent all of the existing treaties so that the Senate could review them and, and understand what the relationships looked like. He brought with him Henry Knox, who was the acting Secretary of War, who had overseen those treaties so that Knox could you know, answer any questions, kind of provide any additional information, not unlike today, like we have when we have um, hearings where experts come and, and senators or congressmen can ask questions of those people. And on the day of his appointment, which was in August of 1782, he brought with him an address and a list of questions. And the address sort of summarized what the challenge was. He had told them ahead of time when he was coming, so the visit was not a surprise. He summarized the challenges, and then he had a list of questions that he hoped would spur debate, would spur conversation, would sort of prompt the discussion. And so he, the address was read, the questions were read, and he waited. And he was met with silence. Some of the senators sort of, you know, like shuffled papers to look busy, others twiddled their thumbs. All strategies I'm sure you have seen students use to avoid being called on. Um, some avoided eye contact, all of the things. Uh, and eventually one senator stood up and said, you know, this is a new subject for us. It was not, he had warned them, but they said, this is a new subject for us. Can you please come back next week and we will give you our recommendation then? Washington absolutely lost his temper, stood up and yelled, this defeats every purpose of my being here, except much bigger, taller, louder, scarier, because this was the most famous man in the world and he was quite furious with them. And his temper was apparently quite a sight to behold when he lost it. He did calm down and he agreed to come back a week later, but on his way out, he reportedly said that he would never again return for advice. And he never returned for advice. And no president since has ever returned for advice. So just four months into his presidency, this key element that was set up by the Constitution to provide the support and the backing for foreign policy for the president, Washington had determined didn't work because the Senate was annoying and inefficient and didn't get things done. Sometimes I don't think I blame him on that. And instead, he needed something that was more responsive, that when there was a real crisis, when foreign policy demanded immediate answers, then he could turn to that person and get the feedback he needed right away. So Washington started instead meeting one-on-one -on -one with his department secretaries. And we talked about earlier how the, there's that clause in the Constitution that says he can request the written advice. And so what he started to do was he would send a letter to the secretaries and they would send a letter back. But then, you know, like he would have follow-up questions or they would want to make edits to something. And they're conducting all this communication, not over email, but with paper and quill. So you have to write it out. You have to sand it so it doesn't smudge. You have to wait for it to be hand-delivered, then wait for that person to hand-deliver the reply back. And then again, what happens if you have follow-up questions? It was a very inefficient system. So Washington started having one-on-one -on -one meetings. It was sort of like a middle ground where he would send a letter so there was at least a record of who was saying what and who was doing what, that transparency that was so important. And then he would invite the secretary to come and meet with him one-on-one -on -one in his private study. And that worked for about the first two and a half years. And it wasn't until November 26, 1791, that Washington actually convened his first cabinet meeting. And I stress that date because most people think the cabinet was inevitable. They think that it was there from the very beginning. But instead, Washington waited two and a half years to bring these people together, to meet with them in one room, because he realized that the topic of the first meeting, which was the trade and diplomatic relationships between the United States and Spain, France, and Great Britain, were huge topics. They were not things that could be handled with one person. They couldn't just be handled with the War Department or just handled with the Treasury Department, but instead required the input and the ideas of a lot of different people to engage their perspectives, to get their different points of view, and if necessary, to have them debate and kind of fight about it so that Washington could see the weaknesses and strengths of both positions. That was really essential in particular for foreign policy, especially in the 1790s because there were these two warring nations that had hated each other for centuries, France and Great Britain, and there were different factions of Americans that sided with both. And so by having both perspectives in the cabinet, Washington could make sure he wasn't veering down one path or the other. 
So I nodded to this moment earlier in our conversation, but 1793 was both one of the high points of, Warren, of Washington's foreign policy, but also the high point of cabinet activity. In February of 1793, France declared war on Great Britain. It quickly spiraled into an international conflict. Washington received word of it in April, and he immediately sent the cabinet a list of 13 questions, basically saying, what do we do? How do we do it? How do we manage our existing relationships? And how do we manage our citizens such that they stay out of this conflict? They met as a group, and he decided to issue a proclamation. Now notice the proclamation doesn't actually say neutrality, because neutrality is a very technical legal term. It just says a proclamation, and it's basically worth staying out of it type of proclamation. It immediately gained the name, the neutrality proclamation, because no one was fooled about what he was trying to do, but he doesn't actually use that language. So he has declared the United States is staying out of the war, but then what happens next? Again, Congress is out of session, always out of session when anything interesting happens. And he meets with the cabinet and they, over the summer, come up with a series of rules of neutrality to try and govern what Americans can do in times of neutrality, what foreign actors can do on American soil, and how the government will respond when either of those groups don't respect the boundaries that were established. This was particularly important because of the gentleman on the right. His name was citizen Edmund Charles Genet. He was the French minister to the United States, probably the worst minister in the history of ministers to have ever existed. Uh, he did not have a very diplomatic temperament. He had very strong opinions about what the United States should do and was pretty determined to make them do it regardless of what anyone else said. So he first arrived in Charleston. He was supposed to arrive in Philadelphia. His ship was blown off course. He arrived in Charleston. He Im immediately started having these parties to celebrate the French Revolution, the French uh, role in this war, and to try and get Americans to participate. He then learned of the neutrality proclamation and did not adjust course whatsoever, and slowly made his way up to Philadelphia to present his credentials. Upon his arrival, Jefferson told him, like, basically knock it off. Like, we have decided we are not participating in the war. And Janae said that's nice and continued doing exactly what he was doing before. Now, the problem was that the treaty that had been signed between France and the United States, called the Treaty of Defense, required both nations to come to the aid of the other. Jefferson argued, it's fine, we can ignore this treaty because France attacked Britain. Britain didn't attack France, so we are not obligated to participate, but the treaty still stands. We can still be good allies. It's all fine. Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of Treasury at the time, said the treaty is not in effect because, to quote the great words of Lin-Manuel Miranda, the person with whom we signed it's head is in a basket. And he was he was correct about the head. I'm not sure he was correct about the legal interpretation because that's a little bit fuzzier. But the treaty had been signed between the king and between the American government, and the king was obviously no longer alive because the French Revolution had taken a very bloody turn. So what Genet was basically saying was, you are obligated to come to our aid by this treaty, and Americans were saying, no, we're not. This was complicated by the use of privateers. Are there any West Wing fans in the audience? Wonderful. So one of the all-time best episodes is the privateer pirate episode in which um, Abigail Bartlett's membership at the DAR uh, is questioned because her ancestor was a privateer and some of the people thought that her ancestor was a pirate. Um, it's fantastic. For anyone who hasn't seen it, highly recommend. Privateers were used by every power that was engaged in any sort of conflict in the 18th and 19th centuries. It was basically a private ship that was captained by a citizen sailing under a, what was called a letter of mark or a license from a foreign nation to attack that nation's enemies. So how it worked in practice, France would hire an American captain whose ship would then go out and attack British ships, drag that ship back to port, sell off anything valuable, turn it into a new privateer, and continue. Again, it was totally common practice. That was not the problem. The problem was that Janae was doing this in the port of Philadelphia. The port of Philadelphia is where the right star is. Washington's house was where the left star was. The British minister also lived in Philadelphia, and this activity did not go unnoticed. And Janae's privateers were really, really, really good. 
So they were going out and he named them things like Liberty and he named one after himself, of course. And they would drag back British ships right into the port and the British minister lived like five blocks away. And so he would go to Jefferson and say, excuse me, this doesn't seem like particularly neutral behavior. So the cabinet did a couple of things. They met, they solidified these rules, basically said ships can come into port, they can buy neutral goods, they can buy food, they can make repairs, they cannot buy weapons, they cannot uh, sell off privateer supplies or their um, successful bounties. And they sent those rules to Congress. Congress codified them into law, and they became actually the law that governed neutrality all the way up through the end of the 19th century. In doing so, Congress said to Washington, basically, they didn't say it in so many words, but tacitly said, well done handling the situation. Thank you for taking the initiative. We approve of your rules, carry on. It established a precedent that when there was a crisis like this, the president was the person to act. The cabinet also requested the recall of Citizen Genet from France, which was approved, and that was a very important precedent. It was the first time the United States had ever done so, and it established the precedent that the United States was a sovereign nation, had the right to establish its own foreign policy, and to demand that fo foreign policy be at least tacitly respected by foreign actors on American soil. Interestingly, once his recall was passed, Washington did not make him leave because he knew that if he left, he would immediately be executed during the reign of terror. So he went to New York, he married the governor of New York's daughter, and he lived the rest of his days as a private citizen and actually made no more trouble. So once he was uh, recalled officially, he was a very quiet citizen. So Washington establishes this precedent that the president is going to be the dominant power in foreign policy. He then uses that power the following year when he sent the Chief Justice John Jay to Great Britain to negotiate a new treaty, this time with um, the Great Britain. He sent him to London, and it was to resolve some of the lingering tensions from the revolution. And most of the tensions involved uh, either the seizure of ships, lingering debts, or forts out west. Jay came up with a treaty which definitely sort of sold out some Southern interests, but I think for the most part was about as good of deal as it could possibly be had because the United States had absolutely zero leverage. So the fact that he got any concessions was fairly remarkable. He brought the treaty back, the Senate ratified it, and Washington signed it, and it then went to the House. And it went to the House because the House basically needed to raise funds for a commission to comply with the terms of the treaty. And most of the Democratic Republicans in the House absolutely loathed this treaty. And they thought that Washington and Jay had really sold out their interests. And if they could bring forth the papers, then maybe it would embarrass them enough to, to scuttle this treaty and it wouldn't go into effect. So they put forth a request for the presidential papers about this treaty, the instructions he had given to Jay, all of the negotiations, and he asked for them, um, they asked for them to review. And Washington sent back a letter on, on March 30th, 1796. It is my favorite letter that Washington ever wrote. It's incredibly snarky. And he's not usually snarky, especially with Congress. But he says, basically, foreign policy, or what we would call national security, requires secrecy. We are engaging in conversations with our allies. They are expecting that there's going to be a certain level of secrecy involved. And if we put forth all of our conversations, they're not going to trust us. He's talking about maintaining alliances and relationships. And so while he doesn't use the language executive privilege, he does assert it for the first time. It establishes the precedent that executive privilege is the thing. It's especially important when it comes to national security. He then says, I was at the Constitutional Convention. I was there when we were deciding who had a role in foreign policy and how that was going to work. And I, I don't remember the House of Representatives having a role. And if you don't believe me, I have the journals from the convention and the State Department offices. And you're welcome to come look at them. It's like the ultimate mic drop moment. It's incredibly, incredibly snarky. Needless to say, uh, they did not go look at them. Um, they knew that he was correct in this instance, and uh, the effort to scuttle the treaty collapsed, and the Jay Treaty did go into effect. <laughs> 
Just a couple of years later, John Adams was tested when it came to the alliance concept and the, the foreign policy concept. Relations with France had really deteriorated after the Jay Treaty because they felt like it was very unfair, and they started to seize French ships, or excuse me, French ships started to seize American ships and um, seize all of the goods and sometimes impress the men that were on board. Adams sent a three-person commission to try and negotiate a, a treaty. It was called the XYZ Affair. That's what it turned into. The three men that he sent were John Marshall, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, and Elbridge Gary. He sent them and they immediately were met with these unofficial representatives, these unofficial people from the French government that didn't have any sort of title or power to negotiate. They demanded bribes and loans and really inappropriate apologies on behalf of the president. And he, and um, they wrote, and basically the American officials decided that they were not going to adhere to any of these demands. They refused to participate. And they uh, sent back these reports of these conversations. And those re reports became known as the XYZ dispatches. It was called XYZ because the people they were meeting with, they didn't list their names. They were called Agent X, Agent Y, and Agent Z. Once these reports were made public, the American people were absolutely outraged. They felt like it was a real insult to their sovereignty, a real insult to national honor that these terms had been demanded, and there was a real lead up to war. We'll talk, I mean, if you're able to join me this evening, I'll talk a little bit more about this process, but ultimately Adams asserted his right to send another commission once it was clear that the French government would indeed meet the terms of uh, diplomacy between two sovereign nations. And um, in addition to, of course, making defensive preparations, so they expanded the army, they created a navy for the first time, and he did send new ministers in 1799, which produced the Treaty of Mortefontaine. The Treaty of Mortefontaine was signed in the fall of 1800 between Napoleon and the U.S. representatives. It established the longest lasting alliance in the world between the United States and France. We have been at peace ever since. There's much more, of course, than just treaties and um, preparations for war to maintaining alliances. Um, some of the other examples of the sort of in-between things that have occurred over time Ulysses S. Grant, after his presidency, he conducted a world tour. And while he was no longer in office, in some ways he was still treated as the president. At that point, travel took a really long time. And so even though he was no longer in office, it wouldn't have been possible for the person in office to go around the country and take months and months and months and months to see all these different nations. So he went, to, um, he went to Asia, he went to the Middle East, he went to Africa, he went to Europe, and he received actually really extraordinary gifts from all over the world, many of which are, still exist in the White House collection, including a couple of Arabian stallions, which I'm not sure how he got back, but nonetheless, that's a pretty cool present to receive if you're traveling. Um, another example of alliances and presidential participation on the world stage is Theodore Roosevelt and his role in the Panama Canal. So for some time prior to Roosevelt's administration, the United States had been interested in acquiring a financial interest and control over a canal. It was going to make trade and travel much, much easier rather than having to go all the way down through uh, or either around South America or through the, I think it's called the Strait of Magellan. Is that right? My navigation skills are, I haven't really studied on that since like the gold rush in for my fourth grade unit. Um, and so in 1902, Congress passed what's called the Spooner Act, which basically gave Roosevelt the right to try and pursue rights to uh, any sort of territory and pursue a participation in the Panama Canal. At that time, Panama was still part of Colombia, and Colombia was very resistant to any American participation. So Theodore Roosevelt encouraged Panamanian independence, encouraged the separation of the two nations, and sent a number of warships to block Colombian troops from crushing the rebellion. This has later been called gunboat diplomacy, which I think is a very apt description. Um, once, the, uh, once they blocked those ships and the rebellion was successful, they then immediately signed a treaty with the new Panamanian government, which gave the United States rights to basically run the canal and enjoy the profits of the canal for a very long time. At the time, Theodore Roosevelt said, I took the isthmus, started the canal, and then left Congress not to debate the canal, but to debate me. 
And I think that is both a very accurate um, distillation of Theodore Roosevelt's personality, but also a demonstration of how oftentimes the president does something and kind of forces Congress to either reject it or deal with it. And um, certainly in foreign policy, that is true. Not everyone loved this. At the time, the New York Times called it a sordid act of conquest. So it's not always popular, but it, he certainly um, received a lot of acclaim from those who wanted to have that type of role in Latin America. So some of the, the more traditional acts of maintaining alliances and maintaining diplomacy occurred in World War I and World War II. The picture of the left shows Woodrow Wilson where he was uh, in Europe to help negotiate the end of World War I to try and figure out the League of Nations. He, of course, presented his 14 points, which were um, Ultimately, while not successful, were some of the ideas behind the original creation of the United Nations and the, this concept that there should be an international community to try and talk with one another and prevent future war. We talked a little bit this morning about FDR and Churchill's close relationship. They, of course, met at the White House. They met on various warships off of Newfoundland, but they also met in Europe several times to figure out strategy, to, to figure out the next steps in the war. And later, they included meetings with Stalin and with de Gaulle as well. And those in-person meetings proved to be pretty essential. Some people suggest that towards the end of the war, FDR's health was really failing him. He, in fact, did not leave to, live to see the end of it. And he, some people think he maybe got sort of run over by Stalin towards the very end because he didn't have the same sort of force of personality that he had earlier, which I think just demonstrates that while there are structures in place, oftentimes the people in, in those offices do make a very big difference. Eisenhower was uh, notoriously good at understanding this type of diplomacy. He, as a Supreme Allied Commander during World War II, he had understood the importance of the diplomacy, and so he had worked with leaders from England, he had worked with generals and admirals, he had maintained these relationships and developed political skills, I think probably far better than most politicians, because trying to keep all those nations together in the middle of a war was no small feat. He then used those skills and used those relationships, many of whom were in positions of power after the war, to try and create a post-war world that reduced the likelihood of nuclear annihilation. His meetings in Europe with some of the Soviet leaders led to some of the first um, limits on nuclear weapons, or at least conversations about limits on nuclear weapons. And he really staked his personal, I think his personal prestige, his personal stature, and his ability. I mean, no one was going to call Eisenhower squishy, right? No one was going to call him weak on war or weak on any of those things. And so he used that to his advantage in a way that was quite effective. He was also apparently an absolutely brilliant poker player. In fact, most of his demerits from West Point come from playing poker. And he had to be careful because he was so good that sometimes he would like create rifts among his fellow students because he would win so much money off of them. So he had to occasionally strategically lose so that he wouldn't clear them all out all the time. And those are very useful skills if you're trying to tell if you know your fellow diplomats are bluffing. So you know, not that I'm suggesting gambling, but if you're going to get into diplomacy, it's not a bad skill to have. As I was pulling together images and videos for this session, I was struck by the prevalence of Berlin in the, um, in the role of the president and foreign policy and being a representative on the world stage and how many times it has showed up for different reasons. In some of your resources, I included clips to all three of these talks. And it's interesting because they're very, they, they come from very different places. Eisenhower, or excuse me, Kennedy's talk is sort of at the beginning of the Cold War, and he's, it's at the beginning of when Berlin is divided. He's talking about the importance of democracy and fighting for these causes and these ideals, but the Cold War hasn't crystallized yet. Whereas when Reagan is there, he's literally saying, tear down this wall. Um, but highly recommend it. And you know, as someone who grew up with sort of a Reagan baby, I went back and I watched this speech. And man, could he talk about democracy. He really knew how to sell it. So highly recommend going back and watching that. And then, of course, Obama actually visited Berlin as part of his campaign um, in 2008, when he was trying to make the case that he could be sort of a new age of American diplomacy. 
And the pictures of him, I, I was trying to find a picture that showed both the Brandenburg Gate and also the crowds, and I wasn't able to find one, but the crowds that were there to see him were insane. Um, and it's, it's just a really interesting example of how the president or presidential candidates know that they have to be this force on the world stage, and yet Americans often don't vote based on foreign policy, and yet it is still a big part of what they're supposed to do. I wanted to include um, these more recent images of Biden at Normandy because this is not an instance of where you know, either a treaty is being negotiated or we are pushing back on a Cold War ally, although there were certainly parallels to that in, in the remarks, but it was an example of almost alliance maintenance, and that is a very important part of presidential duties. It is to maintain good relationships and to recognize when that alliance has gone well. And so um, he very intentionally echoed Reagan's point to hawk speech, and um, which is another example of Reagan speaking brilliantly about democracy. And uh, so I think those echoes, that very intentional choice, and of course this was probably the last anniversary which the people who actually fought at D-Day were going to be present. So an important milestone to commemorate. One of the other elements about um, foreign policy are, are the other things, the, 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 the money piece, the, the border piece, and of course, security. So trade was an essential part of foreign policy early on for presidents, starting with Washington. A big element of the Jay Treaty that Chief Justice John Jay negotiated was reopening Caribbean ports that were managed by British forces to American ships. They had closed them once we declared independence, and American merchants wanted back in them so that they could sell stuff and buy stuff. And it was successful. It did open, the, it did open certain ports to American ships of certain sizes. John Adams continued this trend in uh, shortly after the French Revolution in slave forces at, in Saint-Domingue, which is now Haiti, declared independence inspired by the rebellious rhetoric. And uh, the Haitian Revolution over the next decade plus was incredibly contentious and very violent, but was both a, obviously a, a movement for independence, but was also an opportunity. And American forces had had a very vibrant trade with people in the Caribbean, and they wanted to resume that trade. And so uh, basically the Haitian government, led by Toussaint Louverture on the right, sent, um, sent, they didn't send ministers, but they sent representatives to Philadelphia, where John Adams and the seat of government was located, and they asked not for official diplomatic recognition, but for trade recognition. And John Adams and Timothy Pickering, who was the Secretary of State, did indeed agree to these terms. They um, signed a, a trade agreement between the United States, Great Britain, and Haiti. And what the agreement basically said was that Haiti would do its best to not permit the revolution to spread to British colonies in the Caribbean and would not allow too many refugees to go to the United States because Southerners were very concerned that that enslaved uprising might come to the United States. And in return, American ships would bring tons of food and sell it to Haiti because most of Haitian land was used for sugar cultivation. And so they needed food and supplies to keep their people going. While it was very much an economically motivated moment, it was actually a symbolic one because it was the first time that the American government had engaged in any sort of arrangement with a black-led government or black-led sovereign nation. Trade and agreements can take all sorts of um, different different types, um, all sorts of different arrangements. The, the image on the left is a cartoon of what was called the Gentleman's Agreement, which was a series of conversations and letters exchanged between Theodore Roosevelt and the Japanese government in 1907 and 1908. In, and it was, it was never, there was no official document ever signed, hence gentlemen's agreement. And it basically repealed the school segregation orders in California, which separated Japanese students from white American students. And in return, the Japanese government would not permit any new 
immigrants to come to the United States, with the exception of wives of people who were already on American soil. And this was partly to reduce the racial tensions in California. There, were, there was a great deal of xenophobia, especially around um, the expansion of the railroad and other various different laboring industries. And so the Japanese government basically said, if you treat the people there a little bit better, we will not permit any more to come. This is an important moment because usually up until this point, Congress had really taken primary control of immigration. And so this was a moment when the president was sort of working outside the bounds of the law, not illegally, but not necessarily signing a legal agreement to limit who could and could not come to the United States. The image on the right is of the Treaty of Washington, which was signed during Ulysses S. Grant's presidency. It was negotiated by Hamilton Fish, who was the Secretary of State, I think the all-time best name for a Secretary of State personally. Um, and it was a really important treaty because it uh, resolved tensions between the United States and Great Britain left over from the Civil War in which they had kind of maybe silently sort of helped the Confederacy from time to time, and the United States wasn't very happy about it, but it also established the principle of international arbitration. So that if there was a conflict between two nations and you had to settle an, like a financial agreement, how you were going to do that, and it created this concept of international arbitration. These cartoons and the picture up top show um, the development of the Lend-Lease Agreement. The Lend-Lease Agreement was not a treaty. It was basically a way for the United States to give as much supplies to Great Britain to fight the war against Nazi Germany without actually signing a treaty. And they sent all of our old military stuff in return for 100-year leases of naval bases that were gonna be very useful to us. Um, it was a way to get around the Neutrality Act, which was currently on the books. It was FDR's sort of brainchild. I'm not sure if it would stand up to a lot of strict scrutiny legally, but it was actually fairly popular because there were a lot of people that did support financial aid. They just didn't want to actually get involved physically in the war at that point. The image on the left depicts NAFTA. NAFTA is the North American Free Trade Agreement. It was signed in 1992 and ratified by the Senate in 1993. So trade is still very much a relatively new thing. It established a policy of no tariffs or taxes between goods that were traded between Mexico, the United States, and Canada. It creates the largest trade bloc with no tariffs in the entire world and um, was initially, of course, negotiated by the president, but then it was indeed ratified by the Senate. So the Senate does still ratify treaties, at least in the relatively recent history. The image on the right is um, weapon sales from 2014 to 2018. So weapon sales are a really important area that's of contested authority. Technically, the president can sign most agreements for weapon sales without congressional participation or approval, but Congress has at various points blocked the sale of certain weapons to certain places or not given the money to purchase new weapons. So typically what happens is when the United States is ready to sell something, they will sell our older stock and then they will sign contracts with companies to create the new stuff to outfit the US military. And so Congress will block that and effectively blocking the sale. You can see that we are, um, at least in th from 2014 to 2018, we were by far the biggest um, arms exporter in the world. And lastly, the border has become very much a presidential foreign policy issue. What was interesting is I was trying to figure out, like if I Googled for pictures of presidents going to the border, how far back could I get? And I really kind of tapped out once I got past George W. Bush. So the concept of a president going to the border as like a regular part of presidential duties is I actually think a pretty new phenomenon. Um, and you know, that makes sense because when I think about like Washington and the border, Borders were extraordinarily porous in the 18th century and the 19th century. They were, I guess, at certain ports fairly well defended, but that's about it. Um, the concept of border security, I don't think really even started to 
I don't even know when it started to register, but if I had to guess, I would say it started to register during the Cold War when people were concerned about nuclear weapons and inf infiltration. And then I think started to think more seriously about it um, as terrorism began to be a pressing issue. Because when we think about the southern border, which these, of course, all, um, all depict, uh, there were there was regular migration back and forth up through World War II for laborers who came back and forth to work day jobs, either seasonally or sometimes even daily. And the United States and Mexico regularly signed agreements that facilitated that movement back and forth, especially when so many American soldiers were abroad and we needed to have hands on deck to work the farms and other types of, of labor in that way. So lastly, war powers and... Um, the ability to actually fight war. We talked a little bit about what these, what these clauses look like in the Constitution this morning, but just to kind of re refresh our memory and for those who are, who are watching at a later point, this is what the President says, this is what the Constitution says about the President's right to be the Commander-in-Chief. Almost right away that that didn't mean much. And I think that's largely because of how wars were fought in, in the early decades after the ratification of the Constitution. Although the White House was indeed burned in 1814, much of the War of 1812 was fought away from the White House. And when we think about the wars that followed immediately, including the Mexican-American War, it was fought very far from the White House, very far from the seat of command, if you will, which meant that the president had almost no role in the day-to-day -day strategy of, what, of how the war was fought and how troops were moved and who was attacked and when. And it was really up to the more... Um, immediate command on the field of battle. That started to change when the telegraph became a thing, when the telegraph made immediate communication possible and um, allowed the president to be able to determine like, what was happening in any given battle in, in almost real time. The arrival of railroads as a reliable form of transportation also meant that Lincoln could actually go to the battlefields, which was pretty extraordinary. The expansion of what it meant to fight a war was actually a joint effort between Congress and the president. The left is a picture of the draft riots in New York City. The concept of a draft was a new one. It was implemented for the first time in the Civil War, as was an income tax to actually fund said war. So it wasn't just the president's authority that was expanding, but also Congress's at this point. With any war, there is what we might call like good expansion of presidential powers, but there's also expansion in some ways that we might find uncomfortable, and Congress sometimes goes back and says, yes, this is okay, and sometimes does not. So, for example, early on in Lincoln's presidency, he suspended the writ of habeas corpus, and Congress was concerned that this would either be deemed um, inappropriate or illegal later on, and so they actually went back and passed a law approving his use of habeas corpus and giving him the right to do so in certain places in certain times. FDR approved the internment of Japanese American citizens. There had been some internment in World War I, but not nearly on the same scope or scale as World War II. While the Supreme Court initially did approve that decision, it of course over time has been rejected and there have been official apologies and rejections of that policy since. And then the last piece is Truman's use of nuclear weapons. I don't want to say that that is good or bad on the same way that Japanese internment, I think, is a clear no, and we don't want to do that kind of moral behavior. But nonetheless, Truman was the one to issue the order to use nuclear weapons. Congress was not involved in that decision. So it was almost a unilateral decision by the president with, of course, the advice and support and guidance of his military advisors. And that is an expansion of presidential powers that I think the framers would have trouble even wrapping their minds around, not only because they would have no idea what nuclear powers are, but it's just such a huge, um, it's such a huge shift in what the world looks like. As we move forward, I think this is one area where there's a great deal of room for reform and expansion and rethinking what this looks like, how we want to approach it, and um, what the roles of the different branches are. In terms of the wars that have actually been declared by Congress, there have only been five. Most of the longest wars, certainly some of the deadliest, are not on this list. That's probably something we should think about as a general rule of thumb. 
when wars that have taken place that Congress starts to question, when there's reporting that either the executive branch is not being honest about how things are going, when reports on the ground that things aren't going well, as was the case in Vietnam, then you started to see Congress pushing back, looking, conducting investigations into how the war was actually going, and ultimately passing the War Powers Act, which tried to rein in some of that presidential authority and required the president to consult with Congress, um, how quickly they had to consult with Congress, and what that meant. The War Powers Act is still on the books, although it has been amended, but the problem is that it has turned out to be incredibly squishy in its interpretation. Um, what does consult with Congress mean? What, you know, what are American forces? Who counts as an American force? Um, what is imminent involvement? What are hostilities? These are all questions that as the scope of war and the type of war and weaponry in war changes, interpretations of these things change as well. Certainly the war on terror brought a lot of these questions home. Shortly after the attacks on September 11th, Congress passed this joint resolution, which gave pretty broad and expansive powers to the president to combat the threat of terror going forward. Congress, again, has since clawed some of this back, trying to restrict what the president can actually do, has established some guidelines on when force can be used, and there's an ongoing effort to try and figure out how to manage the advent of things like drones. That was a part of war that was not envisioned in the Vietnam War. It was certainly not envisioned in World War II or in the founding era. Our relationship with the civilian and military population continues to be an ongoing question. So the United States has uh, at least a long tradition early on of being a little bit distrustful of standing armies, of being distrustful of military power at the heart of our executive. And yet over time we have elected 12 generals. Now some don't really count because they were like Rutherford B. Hayes and they were you know, sort of like a voluntary general during the Civil War. These are the three that I think of as really being the generals. Um, and I do so for a couple of reasons. One, they did not hold any sort of elected office or political position between the time that they were in command and the time that they took the office of the presidency. Two, they uh, were the head of military command of whatever they were commanding, whether it was the commander in chief of the Continental Army or the head of the American forces or the Supreme Allied commander. Three, their reputation was so unparalleled when they took office. Now, Washington was elected unanimously twice. No one, of course, ever was going to do that again. But Grant and Eisenhower were really quite unparalleled in their own time. And yet all three were very attentive to civilian oversight to civil military divide, to respecting and honoring that. Eisenhower, of course, most famously gave the military industrial complex speech in which he warned about allowing military to really take over society and the damage that that could do to long-term democracy. I should say that there's also other threats to the civil military divide. I mean, right now we have what's called an all-voluntary army which means that we don't have a draft. On one hand, all voluntary armies tend to be much more effective because when you have a, a draft, that means you're gonna draft people who are not particularly always effective as soldiers. On the other hand, that means that a very small percentage of the population tend to bear the brunt of any cost of war, of fighting the war, their families bear the brunt of it, and most citizens are pretty detached from the realities of that conflict. So there are pros and cons to both situations. Um, but I think that as we move forward, we will have a question of like, what is the role of the military? What is the, the, what is the role of politics in the military? We are always questioning in election cycles if generals can speak out, that kind of thing. I suspect that will continue to be a conversation. And lastly, just some other issues that I could foresee being foreign policy questions going forward. So the picture on the left is a picture of NATO. NATO is, of course, the North American Treaty Organization. It is a treaty, but there is a question of can presidents leave treaties without Senate confirmation? Senates have to approve treaties. Do they also have to approve leaving them? That will be a question that I think will absolutely come up in the future. 
The military has deemed climate change one of its most pressing threats because it affects how they outfit their soldiers, where they keep their ships and other vessels, um, what sort of threats they have to think about. Extreme heat and storms are always a risk. So I think climate change is always going to be a pressing challenge for foreign policy. It also tends to exacerbate existing refugee situations. So as we think about the flow of people and how that is a foreign policy question, that should be something to think about. Uh, Ukraine, the war in Ukraine is absolutely going to be a uh, foreign policy topic of conversation going forward. We are not officially in the war, and yet we are very much supporting Amer Ukrainian forces. And so the role of the president to determine that level of support is going to be pressing. And lastly, Tariffs. Tariffs. I, I used to make a joke that tariffs weren't particularly a sexy topic, and apparently I was wrong because they have come back in full force as a um, election topic. And um, so I suspect that that will be a absolutely a foreign policy question and one about the executive that we have to face going forward. So those are just some of the challenges I see on the horizon. So what are your questions? Let's discuss foreign policy, war powers, the president's authority evolution, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry, you have to stand up to use the microphone. In theory, I guess we could also pass it around. Just please use the microphone. Thank you. Is it on? Uh, boom mic or, okay. So in your experience and your expertise, which president was able to juggle all these facets of foreign policy the most effectively in their time as president? Yeah, it's great. I love the way you phrase that because you're right that it is a juggling act. I mean, the fact that one person is kind of supposed to be overseeing all of this is insane. Um, I think the presidents that have done it best are the ones that both have a powerful foreign policy presence themselves, like Eisenhower or FDR, but also know not to are, are not afraid to delegate because you cannot do everything yourself. So Grant was really good at delegating. Eisenhower was really good at delegating. FDR a little bit less so. I think that, I mean, I think in the 20th century, I think Eisenhower was probably the best, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you referenced the gentleman's agreement that we had with Japan, completely unofficial, but did any other presidents over the time, like especially when we get into the civil rights era of our history, did any of them ever attempt to use that as a precedent to try to desegregate schools before Brown versus the board? Oh, that's a great question. So um, both Truman and Eisenhower talked about the foreign policy implications of the civil rights movement. And they referenced with great specificity the fact that Hitler had studied in some detail Jim Crow laws as a way to create a second class set of citizens, and that the Soviet Union was using segregation as a way to say that communism was better. So they didn't necessarily try and use it like to actually create a legal agreement like Theodore Roosevelt did, but they were using it as a powerful moral tool of persuasion. And, um, and in some cases, I mean, I don't think, you know, in some cases it didn't work and, and it required force to actually desegregate some areas and Supreme Court rulings. But it certainly did have an impact if you're trying to fight, um, you know, a Cold War against a party and they're going to use this against you. That is going to be a compelling argument. Thank you. Yeah. Hey. Um, you mentioned the Lend-Lease Act, which is something that I like to bring up well, when we're studying it, bring up to our students to kind of tie it to current events. Because as I understood it, our war with Ukraine, we are still using the Lend-Lease Act. It's still on the books. And you had mentioned that we are getting um, leases for military bases. Is that part of the agreement with Ukraine now? Do we have that on the books? Yeah, it's a great question. So. Um, Americans do have bases in, in Europe, and most of them are leases that we have signed, like 100-year leases in places mm -hmm. like Germany. Most of the weapons that we are sending and the funds we are sending to Ukraine are technically loans. So in theory, they would need to be paid back at some point. At some point. They probably at some point would be waived. Um, but the, I'm really glad that you brought that up because the way it's being structured is the same way in that Americans are taking our old tanks, our old weapons that are almost about to expire, that we cannot, we will not be able to use in a year or two, sending them to Ukraine and then signing new contracts with American companies to hire American 
civilians to build new products. So for the American economy, it's a really good thing, just like it was um, in the Lend-Lease Act. We were, we were doing the same thing as we did in the 1930s and early 1940s. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with the U.S. not having officially declared war since World War II, but still participating in a wide variety of wars since then, um, do you see the U.S. ever officially declaring war again? Um, and if so, what kind of circumstance might prompt that? Yeah, it's a great question. So the one that always surprises me is Korea. You would think that that would have been declared, and it was not. Um, I think so. I, you know, I think the reason that war wasn't declared after September 11th is it wasn't a national, like it wasn't a sovereign entity. Um, so I think that it would have to be a sovereign entity that either attacked the United States or attacked a NATO ally, um, assuming we actually stand by our Article 5 obligations. So if, let's say, Germany was attacked by Russia. I think that we would declare war on Russia because it would be an obligation under the NATO treaty, assuming we stand by our treaty obligations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, your pictures of Berlin reminded me that in Dickinson's book, he kind of um, highlights uh, Bush 41 not going to, to Berlin at the end of the Cold War, at the end of the, um, the fall of the Berlin. Wall, um, can you think of another president or situation to where it's kind of been a fail in that situation, that, that type? So um, I want to make sure I understand your question correctly, because I actually think that Bush 41's handling it was like total success. Were you, are you, are you? In the book, there's some people that criticized okay. him for Got not it. going in, kind of taking a victory lap, and it maybe would have made him appear strong um, because he had that you know, reputation. Got it. Okay. Kind of Excellent windy. question. Excellent question. Okay. So this gets out a part of uh, the presidency that we do not talk about enough because it's very hard to quantify and it's um, way less entertaining than like fighting a war and that is restraint. Presidential restraint is so underappreciated. And it's because it doesn't really sell in political politics, and it doesn't, political politics, it doesn't really sell in partisan politics and in party politics and in campaigning. So a great example is John Adams. John Adams could have continued to pursue war. He probably would have been very popular if he pursued war, but instead he felt like diplomacy was in the long-term interest of the nation, practice restraint. It was, it did not really necessarily help his electoral prospects, but I do think it was in the long-term interest, I would make the same argument about Bush 41. So he did not take a victory lap. He probably, well, he certainly would have had a better shot of getting elected or re-elected if he did, but I think by not taking a victory lap, practicing restraint, and allowing there to be like sort of a slow dissolution, he reduced the likelihood of nuclear conflict, which ultimately I think is in the long-term interest of the globe. Thank you. So we've, we've talked some about how the job of the presidency has just kind of become impossible and the importance of delegating. Could you speak to how vice presidents have been used in foreign policy and is that a role that could be fulfilled by vice presidents in the future? Excellent question. So vice presidents were not really a thing until World War II at the earliest. So the office of the vice presidency was created in, I think, 1937. Uh, John Nance Gardner was the first to have an office. Um, Walter Mondale is generally recognized as the first vice president to actually have any sort of influence because he and Carter had weekly lunches. I would argue that the current vice president concept that we think of as like a governing partner or a junior partner was actually a creation of Dick Cheney. So that's a relatively recent phenomenon, obviously. And I think that's partly because Dick Cheney had so much more national security experience than George W. Bush. And so he was able to take what we think of as like a much bigger role in the defense and military and foreign policy aspects of the presidency. And partly that was because, of course, the unexpected events of September 11th. It's a fun sort of reminder that presidents can never predict what they're going to encounter. George W. Bush ran on economic issues and his presidency almost had nothing to do with the economy. So um, since then, however, like Biden had a lot of, when he was vice president, he had a lot of really great relationships with foreign leaders because he had been on the Senate Foreign Policy Committee for decades. And so his relationships were actually quite useful because Obama didn't have as many of those ties. So I do think that going forward, when it makes sense, it's a really good spot for the vice president to be helpful 
uh, Vice President Harris has actually gone to Germany several times and engaged in meetings and by all reports has done pretty well with those um, engagements. I do think it's an area where, especially if the president has to be in office, you know, it's really hard to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth to Europe, even if you do have a private jet. It's still, you know, it's you have a time change and it's time consuming. And so it, it is, I think, an area where they can certainly help to bolster some of those agreements and alliances and relationships with the face-to-face -face time that's really essential. Thank you. Hi. Um, would you agree with the the concept that we probably have gone from an isolationist to an interventionist uh, foreign policy? And if so, when would be the major turning points? Um, well, I think we certainly, hmm, let's see, how would I describe this? So Washington's farewell address that he wrote in September, uh, well, he published in September of 1796 was not an isolationist document. It was a neutral document. And what it basically said was it's really important to not get involved in defensive treaties like the one that they had kind of tried to get out of with France. And that was because that he knew that France and Great Britain were going to fight wars no matter what happened that had nothing to do with American interests. And so you didn't want to get dragged into a war that had nothing to do with your interests. That was not the same as isolationist. He wanted the United States engaging in trade and intellectual you know, exchanges. He wanted them to be a part of the world, but not dragged into things that would hurt them. I think from, if that is sort of like a, let's call that like a step two, we then did at certain points fall backwards into a more isolationist perspective, especially I would say like at various points post-Civil War, maybe um, certainly post-World War I, um, there have been interventionist moments. Certainly, we talked about Panama. That is not an isolationist activity by Theodore Roosevelt. Our participation in World War I was not isolationist. I think we were sort of at peak interventionist during um, the 1970s when we were you know, fighting a lot of different wars on a lot of different corners of the globe that were proxy wars with the Soviet Union. I think we've backtracked a little bit from that. Um, you know, if, if we are supposed to not fight the previous war. In some ways, I think our role in Afghanistan and um, Iraq were a failure to learn the lessons of Vietnam. Um, but we have backtracked a little bit. Americans are not wanting to send troops to any old country just to establish democracy. And yet, I think there's also a recognition that, you know, Oceans might be big, but they're not that big. And what starts in one area of the globe is not going to necessarily stay there, especially as things like AI and technology continue to expand and cyber warfare is, is a thing that can make distances disappear like that. So I think we're kind of trying to negotiate what is a, what is a middle ground between intervening in every single conflict, even if we really don't have any business being there, and also recognizing that we can't use our very friendly neighbors and two big oceans as something to hide behind. Did that answer your question, or do you have a follow-up? Oh, well, it was a very complicated question, and you answered it exactly as I expected. Thank you. Yes, uh, I do have a compli another complicated follow-up. Yes. How would Thomas Jefferson or the framers feel about the concept of empire of liberty today with our protectorates? Oh, that's a very excellent question. So Jefferson didn't necessarily think that we should go and enforce liberty everywhere. Yeah. He, and he was definitely not an isolationist because of course he purchased the Louisiana <laughs> territory and was very happy to expand American borders ignoring the fact that there were a lot of people that already lived on that territory and a lot of sovereign nations that were already making their home there. Um, so he wasn't isolationist per se, but when he thought of like the emperor of liberty or the empire of liberty, it was more of like an ideas-based liberty. Like he wanted the American ideals of democracy and equality and liberty for all to, to inspire similar revolutions around the globe. It has been other presidents since then that have taken that idea and said, well, let's actually enforce it and see what can, see what can happen. Um, certainly, most of the framers, Jefferson included, had an idea of like racial hierarchy, and so I think that they and they were also very interested in expanding American borders and buying land. And there was this whole period where people were certain, certain that Cuba was going to be part of the United States and they were going to be able to to snatch it up. So that I think certainly has been a part of the American thinking for quite some time. But I think they saw like buying land and adding to American territory as different than trying to prop up an independent nation elsewhere. 
Good afternoon, Professor. Um, I'd just like to know what your thoughts are about Ukrainian success or failure against Russia, and either way, what impact would that have on the future of American foreign policy? It's a big question. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, we started we started this with this session by me saying that I approach history in a very pro-democracy frame of mind, and that I think no democracy is perfect. Um, all democracies have their flaws. Lord knows, when we our democracy was founded, we had slavery embedded in the Constitution. That being said, I think democracy is uh, as to, to use court, Churchill's quote: "Democracy is the worst form of governments, except for all of the other ones." And so um, I think. Democracy is good, the spread of democracy is good, the fight of democracy against authoritarianism is always a fight that at least intellectually I want to support. I think the problem with uh, Russia and Ukraine is it's very clear that if Russia were to win in Ukraine, they're not going to stop there. Putin has been very explicit that he wants to basically put back together the, the old Russian empire pre-Soviet Union. He sees, I think he has a portrait of, um, Peter the Great in his, in his office, in his palace, and that's what he wants to re restore Russian boundaries to. And when we are dealing with bullies, whether it's on the playground and we're five years old, or we are dealing with dictators, if you don't push back and if you don't um, fight back against their expansionist efforts, they will only continue to do more so. And we know that because we didn't do much when he took Crimea in 2014, and that therefore emboldened him to try and take more of Ukraine. So I don't think we should send uh, American troops there right now. Ukraine is, of course, an ally, but it's not a NATO ally. That doesn't mean we can't support them financially. And I think that if you ask the, their neighboring countries, places like Poland, places like Latvia, places like Estonia that have the most to lose, they will tell you that if Ukraine falls, they will be next. Um, and so to me, I think Ukrainian success is essential for the long-term survival of democracy, both in Europe, but then also we know when democracies do well in one place, that makes other democracies more successful. And when democracies struggle, that makes other democracies more prone to failure. So to me, it is a global cause for democracy. Right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, hello. Uh, my question, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, hopefully I didn't miss it in your discussion already. Um, why it seems the president sometimes, maybe specific to foreign policy and treaties, uh, but sometimes go to the Senate and sometimes kind of don't. <laughs> and then why do they? Um, is it kind of an optics, like this doesn't look good with this action, or is it a constitutional limitation, or is it, oh, the politics of the Senate at the time? I wish that I had a, a really good answer for you. I think the answer is they go when they feel like they have to, and they don't go if they feel like they can get away with it. Um, so sometimes they go because they're trying to build support for something. They want to get funds. They want to build like moral support, especially presidents who are really good orders. They will go and they will make the case for a particular bill or treaty or supporting an ally or something like that. Sometimes they have to go because they need money. They need Congress to pass money. So for example, our most recent bill that was a bipartisan bill that was passed to support Ukraine, Congress had to pass funds in order to send the weapons to Ukraine. Um, so sometimes the president has to go. If they need the money, they need the funds. If they don't need to, they generally prefer not to because they find Congress difficult and annoying. Um, and sometimes it's a matter of does Congress make them? So presidents can often get away with a fair amount of engagement in force before Congress will do anything about it. And um, that certainly was the case until the War Powers Act was passed, and there have been some efforts to make other enforcements since then. Um, but usually unless Congress makes the president, they won't go. Thank you. Yeah, it's not a very dignified answer, but um, that is the way it is. You may have just answered my question. Um, you talked about Haiti earlier, and for whatever reason, it's a place near and dear to my heart. So in addition to the economic interests that we've had in the past, and, and we have provided stability historically as well, but with their current crisis, um, what do you see as the role of the United States um, 
given that it's affecting their entire government, their entire country, their economy, their people. Um, the United Nations is there, Kenya is there. We have had a very minor role to this point. Do you think we will or should get further involved? Yeah, it's, it's a really great question. And Haiti is an example of events from a very long time ago still having a huge impact because when France finally granted independence. A lot of people don't know this element of it. They demanded that Haiti sign basically reverse reparations. So Haiti had to pay reparations to France for their freedom for a very long time. And it started the country in a deep, deep hole of debt, which made economic development nearly impossible. You're right that it whatever happens in Haiti doesn't stay in Haiti, and it does have an international impact. I think at this point, I don't think the United States should act unilaterally. I think we don't necessarily have a great track record of doing so. And we don't have the attention span or the willpower to put the type of time and financial investment required to actually build up institutions in a long-term way. Nation building is really, really hard and really complex and takes a really, really long time, which is something that is generally, I think, better suited for, in theory, an organization like the UN and then also a lot of the, na the non-government organizations, NGOs, that work are on the outskirts to teach people how to engage in institutions, to teach electoral practices, to start to cultivate the civic environment required to uphold those things which is not in any way supposed to sound pejorative, that that's essential in any country that doesn't have a tradition of you know, democratic involvement that's required. Um, while I believe so strongly in the concept of the UN, it hasn't necessarily proven to be as effective as I would like it to be, so that's kind of a suggestion without a whole lot of backing. Um, and that's a very sad answer. <laughs> I wish I could provide a more hopeful, I just think that if the United States acts unilaterally, it, I don't think it will help. I think like it might help in the short term, but it actually long term would set it back because we, we don't have the staying power in that kind of place. And also, I'm not sure it's a very good look. Like, I don't know that we want to go in as like the saviors, um, whereas if it's a UN action, then it's a recognition that we do live in this international community and we have to try and help uplift the more vulnerable. Um, but that's also a hard sell. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Oh, one more. Sorry, I've got one. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles. Yes. Wilson chose not to work very closely with senators when he went over to overseas. Do, do you think he would have been more successful had he grabbed on to some senators and brought them over to, to Versailles himself? Yes, absolutely. So Wilson was brilliant. Um, pains me to say, as one of the few history professors that ever made their way into the White House, he also had the biggest ego of like anyone in the 20th century, and that's definitely saying something. Um, he uh, was, he really thought that he knew best, and he could go and he could have this 14 points, which were brilliant and lovely in concept, and he could get four nations to sign off on it, which he kind of did, and then he could bring it back and he could sell it to the American people, and that he could go around Congress. He could build a sort of grassroots base of support for this treaty, and the Congress would be forced to ratify it. And if he had been at his peak, it is in theory possible that he might have been able to achieve that, although he had some very, very strong opponents like Henry Cabot Lodge in the Senate who really did not have a whole lot of interest in allowing that to happen. Um, but instead, he had a series of strokes and was inc incapacitated and was unable to really do the whistle-stop tour that he had planned to do to make this sell to the American people. And so Congress did not ratify the League of Nations, which of course killed it basically from day one, because if the United States was not going to be participating, then it was not going to work as the type of international organization that it needed to be. Um, so, so yes, that was an instance where if you're going to sign you know, an agreement that commits the United States to an international community, you have to actually have some congressional buy-in. And it is actually important sometimes to talk to the Senate, occasionally. Hmm. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I think that this is our last, well, hopefully I will see you this evening after dinner. Um, uh, but if not, I hope you have a wonderful evening and I will see you tomorrow. Um, and for those of you who want to learn more about the fabulously colorful John Adams. I do hope I will see you post-dinner back in this room. Um, and if not, I will see you tomorrow morning. Thank you.
Thanks for listening to this week's Lectures in History podcast. To find even more history content, visit c-span.org slash ahtv.